good morning students uh welcome to this particular channel and welcome to this uh, online class on london by samuel johnson it is our second discussion it is our second introductory discussion and in this particular lecture i will concentrate on the political context of london that means prior to moving to this particular text we need to know something about uh, london and uh, why did samuel johnson used this particular text as a a, a typical uh, political agenda that means uh, what is the particular form of political agenda behind uh, the writing of this particular text london so in this lecture i will discuss on the typical political context behind london somehow as you know that uh, a kind of a satire was aimed at uh, walpole and why johnson did that was it something related to the text or was it something related to his own political standpoint or political conceptualization so these are the fundamental details that uh, we have to concentrate on and an issue will be discussed in this lecture so let us move towards the the fundamental orientation of this particular section uh, as we know that there are two particular regions two particular dynasties uh, who are considered to be important in english and the first as we know it was the house of the stuarts and you can find here it's a kind of a timeline it is a kind of a family tree that i have made uh, the family tree is that of the house of the stuarts and you can find the names that have been mentioned here here you can get james the first and you know that it was actually the reign of james the first was generally being considered as uh, the jacobian period as you know Uh, it was james the 6th of scotland and the time period was from 1603 to 1625 so from that particular time period the stuart dynasty came to existence so there is james the 1st and he ruled england from 1603 that is after queen elizabeth to 1625 and then after uh, you will find that is charles the 1st okay and charles the first was there from 1625 to 1649 and as i mentioned that after 1649 to 1660 this is the time that is considered as the age of milton or maybe it was considered as the commonwealth period okay so that particular period that uh, actually uh, to some extent ruled by the republicans uh, led by oliver cromwell right and then you will get after charles the 1st there was the restoration period that begins with charles the 2nd in 1660 and it was there till 1685 and then we can find that his brother came to the throne that is james the 2nd in 1685 and in 1688 the glorious revolution was taken place after james the 2nd there we get Uh, there is mary and william the 3rd that is considered as william of orange that means it was the uh, time period when we get that it is 1689 to 1694 it was the period for mary and then uh, you will get uh, william the 3rd was there after 1694 to 1702 and then anne queen anne uh, that is 16 1702 to 1714 as you can find here and then you will get after queen anne there is the particular reference to george the 1st you see that 1714 to 1727 so after this george the 1st you will get that uh, that particular time period has to be considered as the house of the stuarts you see that is the dynasty of the stuarts which are ruling now from the house of stuarts that is after george the 1st Uh, that is not the first here you can find that the house of the hanovers come to existence and what does it signify you will find that is a kind of a dynasty and it ends with victoria as you can trace at the uh, at this particular slide you will find 
that Queen Victoria, that is the uh, typical, you know, Victorian period that begins with 1837 uh, and 1837 to 1901. It actually ends in this particular fashion. So what you can trace here that it is uh, George the first, number one, then you can get George the second. And after George the second, one particular generation passes away, then it comes to George the third and then George the fourth and then William uh, the fourth, as you can find, you can find the timeline, obviously. George the first ruled between 1714 to 1727. Then you can get it is the time for George the second and George the second ruled from 1727 to 1760. And then there is uh, George the third who ruled England um, and obviously Britain from 1761 to 1820. Then it is George the fourth from 1820 to 1830. And then William the Fourth from 1830 to 1837, and then after William the Fourth, you can get it is Queen Victoria who is ruling England and Britain from 1837 to 1901. So in uh, this is a particular uh, section that I have tried to refer. It is the House of the Hanovers. Why I have mentioned this particular timeline? Why I have mentioned the dynasty of the Hanovers? Just because you will find that uh, Johnson had a particular, uh, to some extent, an antipathy. He was very critical of George II. And George II and the Hanoverian di dynasty, uh, uh, these particular things have to be kept in mind. Why? Because, because uh, there is a particular kind of a tussle was going on between the Whigs and the Tories. Okay. Uh, just because you will find Walpole was the first minister of Britain there, so ultimately, we need to know about the Hanovers and from, from the stewards that the Hanovers came. So uh, that was the thing that I have to discuss here. Uh, fundamentally, after this, I need to uh, show you something about Robert Walpole. This particular slide was being made from uh, the information have been taken from Wikipedia. And I have made this particular uh, reference to Robert Walpole. Who is this Robert Walpole? You will find that Robert Walpole at the time of uh, Johnson, Robert Walpole was the, the first minister, literally. Okay, it is true. And somehow Walpole's designs, Walpole's, uh, you know, the political and at the same time administrative uh, discussions, administrative uh, decisions was not being taken properly, was not being taken positively by the people of the time. And Johnson was one of them. As we can find that Johnson was against the Hanoverian dynasty, Johnson was against the Whigs, and Johnson was against uh, the typical characters like Walpole and George II. So fundamentally, it, it was quite similar. You see that before Johnson, there was uh, Alexander Pope. As I have mentioned earlier, that uh, the time periods can be divided into four major sections. There you can get... Uh, uh, the uh, first it was the age of Milton, then there was the age of Dryden, then there was age of uh, Alexander Pope, and now it is age of Johnson. So you will find here that so far as Alexander Pope in the typical Augustan period, and after that it is uh, age of Johnson, so it is Samuel Johnson, both were framed to some extent. The political ideologies of these two characters were quite similar. So fundamentally, what I'm trying to suggest, whereas uh, I should mention here that uh, uh, the temperament of Alexander Pope and Samuel Johnson was similar, but you can find that that of John Dryden was completely different because John Dryden was an ardent follower of Charles II because he was the coast court poet at the time. So where uh, you can find that uh, somehow the typical Tory mentality you can, uh, the similar kinds of temperaments are there. So you can find that uh, Johnsonian canon of taste was quite similar to that of uh, Alexander Pope. And here you can uh, trace, identify that is Robert Walpole. Who is Robert Walpole? So in this particular section, we will uh, discuss something about Robert Walpole and then we can move towards the, the particular kind of a crisis that is going on. Uh, so fundamentally, what we should I should say here about Robert Walpole that Robert Walpole was the first Earl of Oxford, you see. And you can identify the typical kind of a timeline that had been mentioned here. It was uh, in between 26th August 1676 and 18th March 1745. It was the time period for Robert Walpole. 
and uh, he was known between 1721 to 1742 as Sir Robert Walpolesi, right? And he was a British politician, as we know, who is generally regarded as the de facto first prime minister of Great Britain. So that was the fundamental reason why Robert Walpole has to be discussed in detail here. Because you will find that throughout this particular text in London, as we can find that somehow it's a kind of a criticism that Samuel Johnson is making against London and the typical kind of political, social scenarios of London during his lifetime and what is happening there, the typical kind of administrative failures and corruptions that was prevailing within London. Ultimately, you will find that why we can find here that Thales is trying to uh, escape London, why Thales is trying to, you know, uh, move far from London. It was just because of the decadence that is prevailing throughout London. It is the kind of a corruption and obviously it is a kind of an uh, administrative failure that was going on within London. And somehow you will find that as it is a typical political satire that is being made by Samuel Johnson following, as we have mentioned, that fa following uh, Juvenal, that is the satire by Juvenal, we can find that somehow uh, Walpole's temperament and Johnson's temperament are starkly different from each other. And fundamentally, that is the whole reason why Johnson is taking uh, Walpole to be at his, uh, you know, the focus of his satire. What is the fundamental reason why London is being rewritten at the time? It is not only London, but the same temperament was being reflected in another poem written by uh, Samuel Johnson during this particular time, and it was Vanity of Human Wishes. The two texts there by Johnson, these are very famous, you see. So uh, let us return to Robert Walpole again. And as I mentioned that Robert Walpole was the British politician uh, and who is generally regarded as the de facto first prime minister of Great Britain that I have mentioned here. You will find here that uh, Walpole was a Whig. So that is the thing that I should discuss here that what is Whig and what does it mean. Uh, in my next few slides you will find that the temperament, the actual temperament of the Whigs and, uh, and obviously the Tories that are the, the typical antithetical representations that have been made and somehow you will find that somehow it's a kind of a uh, sociological and political representations and differentiations that have been taken into considerations during this particular time period. So these are the things that I should discuss in detail in the next sections obviously. So what I'm trying to suggest here that Walpole was a Whig as I mentioned here from the gentry class that is very important here because you will find that somehow so far as the political scenario of london is concerned everywhere we can find that uh, somehow uh, a kind of a differentiation is being always made between the house of lords and house of commons you see these are the two uh, stories you see the, the two rooms uh, in the in the parliament british parliament so house of lords uh, that have been associated with the the typical aristocrats and the persons who are coming from the upper strata of society and somehow it is the kind of an hereditary perspective that have been in work whereas house of commons these are associated with the commoners literally and there was a kind of an election that was taken for existence you see and somehow uh, in the uh, during the later periods that is after uh, the time of augustan period we can find that house of commons are gradually becoming powerful why because the you will see that during the Augustan period, what happened, you know, that House of Lords, you see, that as I mentioned, that these were somehow hereditary posts. That means if uh, a father is being uh, a member of the House of Lords, then certainly it had been found that his son will become an automatic choice, uh, the House of, uh, the member of the House of Lords. But it was not in case of the House of Commons, because you will find that the commoners were been elected, you see. And uh, somehow, uh, during the Augustan period, during 18th century, what happened, you know, uh, that House of Commons are gradually becoming powerful. 
why house of commons gradually becoming powerful because you will find that uh, uh, during this time period the house of commons by merchandising by the economic individualism these are the things you see that that have been uh, uh, found in the novels and the writings of the of this period say for exa example in in robinson crusoe you will find that it is the story that how an individual a commoner is gradually becoming a, an a owner of an island you see so Fundamentally, what I'm trying to say is a kind of an economic individualism. He is uh, uh, selling and earning slaves, and he he's uh, being engaged in in um, a tobacco farming and earning money, and somehow explorations of the islands and new new places, and uh, the colonization and so on. So you will find that. But what I'm trying to suggest here that uh, fundamentally it is the particular time period when you will get that by earning something and by gaining money the persons are becoming capitalists it's the rise of the capitalism obviously and fundamentally when you will find that uh, the money is fundamentally being spoken as important and you will find that the commoners or the the ordinary people that is the the typical bourgeois class so they are gradually earning money they are uh, typically they are becoming powerful and the power was on the house of commons at the time you see so when house of commons are gradually becoming powerful so this is the particular time period when one should uh, follow the elections and for elections you will find uh, that campaigning is needed why during this augustan period and during 18th century uh, the uh, the typical you know periodicals and pamphlets and newspapers are becoming important here you will find that through them through the pamphlets through the newspapers the campaigning can be made and probably you will you, you will uh, hear it that uh, somehow the eminent writers of this particular time period it was uh, it was prior to samuel johnson during this particular time period we find that uh, the writers like steel and addison and goldsmith so these writers were hired and they were being paid for writing in some political newspapers and political pamphlets for so so uh, why because it was a kind of it became the propaganda making thing you see so what i'm trying to suggest you see that uh, the two particular political parties one it is the whigs and the second one is the tories who are gradually becoming powerful and ultimately you will find that the whigs have been uh, considered to be the royalists here to some extent because they are su in support of King George II at the time. So uh, here you can get that Robert Walpole. Walpole was a Whig, as I mentioned here. I'm, I'm coming to the, the concept of Whig later. So Walpole was a Whig, as it is being shown here, uh, from the gentry class, as it has been mentioned, uh, who was first elected, you see, the election is being taken place. So elected to parliament in 1701 and held many senior positions. I will come to that later. That's what are the positions. Probably you will go to, if you if you want to know something about Robert Walpole, what are the positions, what are uh, the, the uh, problems that actually arose during this particular time period, uh, you will go to the uh, Wikipedia section where you will get the, 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 the sections, you see, that uh, gradually how Robert Walpole is becoming more powerful during this time period. So held many senior positions. He was a country square, as I have mentioned, and looked to country. He was a country square and looked to country gentlemen for his political base. So that was the thing that Walpole had uh, the knowledge, had the foreknowledge of the commoners, you see. And he identified that if they are, what are the things that he should follow regarding the commoners, but ultimately he didn't do so. Uh, here you will find uh, more about Walpole. It has been written that in, in 1705, Walpole was appointed by Queen Anne to be a member of the council so it was 1705 and there was the reference to queen one queen anne you see okay and as i mentioned it was the last section of the of the Stuart dynasty where queen anne has been mentioned because the the dynasty uh, hanoverian dynasty began with with george the second obviously and george the first obviously so in 1705 walpole was appointed by queen anne to be a member of the council for her husband, who was that? The Prince George of Denmark, Lord High Admiral. 
After having been singled out in a struggle between the Whigs and the government, Walpole became the intermediary for reconciling the government to the Whig leaders. So somehow Walpole had played a very important role there and he was appointed to the position of secretary at war in 1708. Okay, for a short period of time in 1710, he also simultaneously held the post of treasurer of the Navy. So these are the informations that have been taken from Wikipedia and many more other informations have been mentioned there. So you can just browse the pages of Wikipedia and you can get the basic implications and basic importance or uh, basic uh, informations about Robert Walpole there. So after the South Sea bubble, it was a very problematic issue. You see that uh, the South Sea bubble was a, was a very important uh, political and at the same time administrative issue during this time uh, where you can find uh, a particular kind of a problem arose to regarding the trading of the slaves and others you see in the South Sea. So what happened to be, uh, it, it, it was considered by Britain at the time that it was beneficiary regarding the the economic advancement, but somehow some people, uh, they came in between and, and financially you will find that such a kind of a profit was not possible. So uh, some of the people held responsible for corruption, you see, they were the corrupt personalities and somehow they were been uh, made uh, uh, punished. Uh, Walpole there played a very important role because he became, for his personal contacts, you see, he saved some of the people, okay, and he became the most important figure in the administration. So you can go through the particular uh, reference to South Sea Bubble from uh, Google and Wikipedia, and then you will get that how Walpole has become uh, the most important figure in the administration there. Afterwards, what happened, you know, that after the South Sea bubble uh, is the, the fundamental situation, what actually made or actually prepared the future for Robert Walpole. What I'm trying to suggest here, you see that after the South Sea bubble, Walpole became the most important figure in the administration, that is British administration. And in April 1721, he was appointed first Lord of the Treasury, okay, Chancellor of the Exchequer and leader of the House of Commons. That was very important part and very important section in Walpole's career, you see. And after that, we will find that Walpole's de facto tenure as prime minister is often dated to his appointment as first Lord of the Treasury in 1721. So that was fundamentally uh, a typical kind of an outline that I have made regarding Robert Walpole. And again, I should say here that you can go through Wikipedia and I'll try to identify what actually happened to Robert Walpole during this time period, how he's gradually becoming more powerful and important political figure, how he's gaining his power, and what were the basic impetus that Robert Walpole is making regarding them. But the question is, uh, as we can find here, that this particular, as I mentioned, that this particular text that is London by Samuel Johnson, it's a critic of Robert Walpole and at the same time, he was anti-Walpole, uh, the Johnsonian anti-Walpole temperament actually worked behind writing this particular text. And not only that, Johnsonian canon of taste, you know, that have been reflected in the writings like London and Vanity of Human Wishes, that actually uh, made a kind of a critical bent of mind against or of the, uh, uh, the works of uh, George II. So these have been taken in consideration here. But before going to that, we need to know something about the Whigs and something about the Tories. Who are the Whigs and who are the Tories? As we have found that uh, during this particular time period, that is in the neoclassical time period, so far as the political temperament is concerned, we uh, should concentrate on uh, the, these two uh, political parties. That We should know something about them, you see. Who are the Whigs? As it has been mentioned here, the Whigs were a political faction. You see, at the very early form, they are the political fac faction <coughs> and then a political party in the parliament of England, Scotland, Great Britain, Ireland and United Kingdom. So these are the things you see that side by side we have to use. And between the 1680s and 1850s, you see the time period, a long time period from 1680s to 1850s, it is almost 170 years. The Whigs 
contested power with their rivals, the Tories. So these are the two rival parties you see. The Whigs and Tories, probably when you are, it is in your syllabus, or when you were going through uh, the particular text by, by Jonathan Swift, and that is uh, Gulliver's Travels, you will find that there are uh, the, the two political parties being incorporated, you see. You know, the Lilliputians and the Blefuscurians. So you can find somehow that the typical uh, English versus France have been taken into consideration. But in England, that is in the Lilliputians and among the Lilliputians, there you can get the big Indians and small Indians, you know, the reference to the egg and the, uh, the, the sections of the egg and on, on the basis of that, that the two the political parties have been incorporated. So what actually Swift mentioned there, it was a kind of a political allegory that was uh, that is Gulliver's Travels. And you have found that somehow Swift is actually making a kind of a criticism of the Whigs and the Tories. And now and they have been incorporated in the form of the big Indians and small Indians, you see. That uh, the typical, you know, ludicrous way of representation that Swift is taking, but it is a kind of a satire altogether, obviously. Uh, so uh, fundamentally, there are some points on the Whigs, and you see that the Whigs' origin lay in constitutional monarchism, the terms you see, that's the monarchy and constitutional, and you shall find an opposition to absolute monarchy supporting a parliamentary system. So that is the temperamental standpoint for the Whigs. You see that he, their origin lay in constitutional monarchism. You see, monarchy. What does mo monarchy actually signify? Monarchy means something related to the king. And they are actually opposite to the, the typical form of absolute monarchy. Again, it is another term that you can Google and you will find that absolute monarchy is actually being referred to uh, the, the kingship that is only kingship. Uh, without any parliament or so support and they actually support a parliamentary system because you know in England as we know that uh, the, the British throne and the parliament they run side by side so absolute monarchy is not possible for that and Whigs are supporting the parliamentary system not simply the kings you see then you will find in the next point it has been written that the Whigs played a central role in the glorious revolution of 1688 what is glorious revolution as we know it was James II who was actually ruling during this time and in 1688 he was dethroned okay it was called a kind of a bloodless revolution that is glorious revolution and where the standing enemies of the Stuart kings and pretenders who were roman catholic okay uh, probably i have mentioned about george the uh, sorry uh, james the second and his standpoint the typical form of catholicism in my previous lecture so here you will find that the whigs are played uh, are playing a central role in the glorious revolution of 1688 and were, were the standing enemies of the Stuart kings you see and the pretenders who were roman catholic you see so a kind of a protestantism was going on here the whigs took full control of the government in 1715 and remained totally dominant until king george the third coming to the throne in 1760 and then it allowed tories back in so this is the particular time period you see that 1715, they are in full control of the government and they were dominant until King George III and coming to the throne in 1760 and allowed Tories back in. 